Now, before we get into the show, let me just remind you, four days to go to the Tour de France. We've got a preview coming on Friday, and we're going to be getting out videos as soon as the stage is finished, or as close to the end of the stage is finished, depending how much there is to talk about on said stage. So if you want to be privy to all that news, all that information, all that niceness, then hit that subscribe button. If you've already hit that subscribe button, don't press it again. You've already done it. Just make sure that bell's also been pressed. That little notification bell. Just press it and then and then just sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Hello everyone and welcome to Wednesday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Uh, transition. Now before we get into today's show, I thought I'd make a, um, a formal apology to Ben King, as I called him Ted King in yesterday's show. Sticking with yesterday's news, and we announced that Mark Cavendish wouldn't be taking to the start line of the Tour de France. He took to Twitter last night with a, um, quite well, quite a sad tweet, actually. Well, what can I say? I'm absolutely heartbroken by the decision that means I won't be at Le Tour this year. As I had done for my entire career, I targeted a specific time to be at peak form. This has pretty much always resulted in me hitting my goals or coming damn close, predominantly at the most beautiful, special race that is Le Tour de France, where 30 of these victories have defined my career. After a long, difficult fight back from trying to compete for the whole of last season with Epstein-Barr virus, and after following a specific training program to peak in July, I feel I was in the perfect place. Nevertheless, I truly came to Team Dimension Data with the purpose of making a difference by mobilizing entire communities in Africa with bicycles through our incredible charity, Quebecer. Though I won't be there, as always, I'll be supporting my teammates with all I have, wishing them safety and success in France, and hoping we can get even more children on bicycles. Thank you for your support. Praying hands emoji. Kiss. Now, from that tweet, it appears to me that Cavendish potentially had no idea that this was going to happen and he'd been training right up until um, this point of selection in the hope that he was going to go. But from what I said yesterday, like looking at the team, there's no riders in there who you would consider as a, a classic lead out train for Cav to have, to have ridden with. So did they have two options of teams as to whether Cavendish was, was in the form that they wanted him in? Or were the team never actually going to select him and they, they went for this, this other team? Because if he'd have gone into the team that was selected for the tour, he would have been left to his own devices in, in, the, uh, in the bunch sprints. However, I did notice that there was a tweet from Brian Holm in there in, in response to, to Cavendish. Odd situation, last two years you made tour selection with Epstein-Barr virus in your body. Now healthy again and no tour selection. I think that they've looked at the, the rest of the, the sprinters who are out and about now at the minute. And they've seriously considered whether Cavendish can beat him. And when you take a look at what sprinters are going to be there, you can't help thinking that, that he's, he's really going to struggle. I mean, just take a look at a few of them. You've got Sagan, Groenewegen, Groenewegen, Groenewegen. You've got Viviani, Michael Matthews, Caleb Ewan, Christoph. And on his day, Andre Greipel can, can beat the best of them. So did they, did they just look at that lot of, of sprinters and say, yeah, let's... Let's, let's do something else this year at the Tour. So I mentioned Michael Matthews in there, so that's going to perfectly segue me into the next story about Tom Dumoulin, Team Sunweb, and a potential move for him in 2020. Now, depending where you read about this story will determine who you think Tom Dumoulin is going to sign for. For instance, The Cyclist ran with the story that Tom Dumoulin is in talks with Total Direct Energy for 2020. But if you go to The Telegraph in Holland, he's going to be riding for Jumbo Visma. And then if you go across to Twitter, La Flamme Rouge 16 has literally listed every single team in the World Tour that he's going to be signing for next year. So yeah, according to The Telegraph, the um, Jumbo Visma have publicly announced that they would like to sign Tom Dumoulin. Obviously, a couple of hours after this story coming out, Tom Dumoulin took to social media to, to quash any rumours about him moving. But that's not the first time we've ever heard someone say, Absolutely, categorically, I'm not moving. And then at the end of the year, they uh, they subsequently move. But according to La Flamme Rouge, there's also talks of CCC, Team Ineos, and UAE all wanting the rider. Which gets me thinking, why would Team Ineos want Tom Dumoulin? Maybe they see him as the only competition that's going to stop them winning another Tour de France. Or, 
Do they just want a roster full of GC contenders in case what's happened this year happens again and happens on a worse scale where they lose Froome, the next time they lose Geraint and they lose um, Egan Bernal? I mean, it's very unlikely, but is that the case? Or are they trying to buy out all the competition and just they're going to put him in the roster and just say, there you go, you can have a go at the, the La Vuelta, we might let you go to the Giro, but the tour is, is off limits. And because Team Ineos have, you know, has got Jim Ratcliffe, they could literally, I guess with UAE as well, they could throw any amount of money at this rider just to get him. You know, he could be earning as much as G and Froomey. Um, having never won a, a Tour de France, he could go to Ineos on a huge contract, safe in the knowledge for them that he's not going to be a competitor against the team. Now, if you were Tom Dumoulin, right, what would you do? Would you take the big paycheck that could potentially be on offer from someone like Ineos just to stop him winning a Grand Tour um, and go and race La Vuelta, go and race the Giro, knowing that you're never actually going to win the Tour, but you potentially might win another Grand Tour? and get paid 4 million, 5 million euros? Or would you rather go to someone like Total Direct Energy, receive 1 million a year, but you are that leader of that team. That whole team is working for your cause, for you to win the Tour de France, for you to live out a boyhood dream. And what would you do in that situation? Money, and ultimately financial freedom for the rest of your life? or a chance to win the Tour de France on less money. Enough money to live on, way more than he actually needs, but still. So I asked a few of my mates, so I asked a couple of people what they thought, would they take the money or would they take the leadership? So from a sunny uh, Lancashire, just got home from a bike ride, Chris. Uh, I think for me to answer this question personally, it would all depend on what stage of the car my career I am in. If I'm towards the end and I know I haven't got much, much time left in me uh, and I'm probably never gonna be it, you know, better than I was. Um, I think that I would take the higher money and, and play more as a, more of a support role um, and just, you know, earn that cheddar before I, before I retire. However, if I was younger, like me right now, you know, I'm not necessarily motivated by, by all the money uh, and I'd rather be motivated by the opportunities and the experiences and, you know, having the chance to go and, to go and win a grand tour and kind of have that Palmares to my name. So it's a dilemma, isn't it? I mean, none of this might actually happen because don't forget, Tom Dumoulin still got a contract till 2022 with Sunweb. However, after May's crash at the Giro and the fact that he isn't attending the Tour de France this year, uh, there was some sort of falling out within Team Sunweb and he's not in favour there and it seems that he's, he's, he's ready to, to make a move. It's clear from, from the reports that he is definitely ready to make a move. Now, moving on from that, and I want to touch on Egan Bernat. Not like that. I want to touch on his story. All right, of his Strava stats that he's been uh, that he's been knocking out of the park recently. We'll get onto that in a minute, but let's check out what else is happening in the rest of the world of cycling. And the boys in the Cycling Hub office sent me a link to this program that is going out on Channel Five here in the UK on Tuesday. Cyclists, scourge of the streets. What's this program about? I hear you say. Well, let's click about and find out. There is growing tension between two wheels and four wheels. I mean, what? I like to think that the majority of cyclists. And this is the majority want harmony between two wheels and four wheels. They want harmony a lot more than people in cars because they understand how vulnerable they are on the streets. But how is a program like this ever going to tie relationships up and make everyone get along together? In fact, you know what? This tweet, this tweet sums my feelings up on this thing. Dear media, where do I even begin with this? Having a show like this, the one I mentioned, is not helpful to mums like me or any other human who cycle. We are human beings. Parents, families, friends, colleagues, humans. Video of the day. Cycling Weekly have done a great video on the toughest summit at this year's Tour de France. Now this might not be what you would class as a classic Tour de France climb, but it is making a name for itself. And this year it's gonna make a name for itself and stand out even more because the last 2K are going to be on gravel. I mean, we don't know whether they're going to resurface this a little bit. Yeah. Because you, at the you moment, it, think so. it is quite treacherous, yeah. but oh my word, you're going to just hear it, let alone see it. I I'm that. not sure out of the saddle is a good idea because of the wheel spins. With that, we're already up to 10% yeah. on gravel. So 
So after that initial kick up, it's leveled out a little bit here as you go into this wooded section. And the chances are with that video, when you click it and you watch it, you're going to be served a Zwift Academy ad because the Zwift Academy is back. So for those of you who don't know, the Zwift Academy is an eight week training program which can be used by anyone and everybody. The beauty of the Zwift Academy is I could jump on my bike and get something out of it. And my wife, who hasn't cycled ever, could jump on it and get something out of it. But for a small percentage, five or 10%, these riders are entering this training phase to try and win a chance of winning a pro contract with either Team Dimension Data or Canyon SRAM. And it's such a, an amazing idea, an amazing concept, and it's a great way to be able to expose cyclists to the potential of actually getting a professional contract. If you're a cyclist that, that um, you know, is, is struggling for money, doesn't know the right people, um, doesn't live in the right place, then the Zwift Academy is a perfect opportunity to actually say, do you know what? I've got the numbers to be able to be a pro rider. I just haven't got the opportunity to. Well, now you have, and you can do it through the Zwift Academy. And if you're good enough, you go down to the finals where they will eventually pick one rider out to be uh, the Zwift Academy winner, winning a contract with, with either the women's team or the men's team. Now let's move on to Egan Bernal because he's been, uh, I guess the word we'd use is transparent over the last couple of weeks. He's been uploading his rides to Strava with power data on. Now, you don't often see that from a professional rider, let alone a week before the Tour de France starts. What's his game? Is he playing mind games or is he, um, is he, is he just forgetting to private his, his, his rides? I don't know, but, but let's take a look at a few of them and, and see what we can actually gather from them. If you want to follow uh, Egan Bernal on Strava, link down in the description below. But as you can see, he's... Uh, we're on Wednesday now and he's been putting out some big rides. Let's uh, let's take a look at his, tra his training log. A week before the tour and he's putting out 562 kilometers. That's a big ride, let's take a look at that one. Now my thoughts are that he's preparing for the tour. Yeah, he needs to be uh, fit and be able to handle three weeks of, of tour riding. But you wouldn't think someone will be uh, smashing this many hours I don't know, leave a comment below and let me know. What do you, what do you think? Putting a 150 kilometer ride in, it's six hours of, of riding at 3.37 watts a kilo average. I mean, that is, um, is not far off my FTP. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy now. Um, obviously he's been doing all his training in Andorra. Um, I don't know if he lives out in Andorra or he's just selected Andorra as a good place to, um, to base himself because of the, uh, the altitude, but you can see that some of these um, these gradients are, are just insane, and even the the lowest part of these climbs is 1,200 meters uh, above sea level. So reaching up to to, to 2,300 on this climb here. So let's try and um, pick up a few of these climbs and see what we've got going on. Um, let's take this one here, HC category, N Camp, Port del, uh, whatever. Um, you can see on the right hand side here, you've got all the uh, the leaderboards. Now he's obviously not on, on full gas there because it's, ta it's taken an hour, whereas the top the top time by Roman Bardet is 47 minutes. So nowhere near a full gas effort, but I don't know, the week before a, 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 the Tour de France, surely all the training must be done. Like it's just a matter of ticking over, but this, this seems more than ticking over. This seems, this seems like, 
um, like training, 21 minute effort here. And again, you can see um, the riders there, 18 minutes and 25 seconds he's been up there. And then here we've got his, um, his Ultimo Fondito Suave Antes del Tour, which I presume means the last ride before the tour. Knocking out three watts a kilo average for four hours and 22 minutes. We've got a weighted average of 221. And don't forget this guy only weighs 58 kilos, something like that. Got a 31 minute effort there. Again, five minutes off of the pace of, of a full on effort from Adam Yates, but still uh, some, some solid, some solid riding. Now, I don't know if this is um, a regular thing for, for riders to do because most riders hide their stats and hide their rides prior to a big stage race because, you know, they don't want to they don't want to show their hand. Um, but I think he's shown his hand at the Tour de Suisse. I think everyone knows what a classy rider he is and how capable he is. So does it really matter that he's, he's showing people or has he done it to lure them into a false sense of security for them to read it and go, actually, you know, he's not putting out big numbers here and I can put out big numbers on this climb, I've done that climb and I don't know, it's just a shame that professional riders don't put out these these numbers on a regular basis. It's always nice to see um, to see what an actual professional can do, especially on the roads that you've ridden. So if you've ever been up any of those climbs, then you can appreciate those climbs and you can, you can judge your effort compared to them and realise how insanely fit they actually are. It's interesting though and I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think to, to professional riders um, being this transparent with their numbers and their um, their figures and, and, and showing exactly what they're up to prior to a massive Grand Tour stage. So in my haste of trying to get this video up as soon as possible and remembering that I'd forgot to tell everyone right back at the start of the video to subscribe, like and do all that jazz, um, I didn't even say uh, thanks for watching. I didn't even sign off in any way, shape or form. So this is me signing off mid-edit. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, hit that like button. If you want to hit that notification bell, you can do so you know when we go live with our live streams or when we drop brand new videos. As I've said before, four days to go to the Tour de France now. I'm going to be dropping a video every day during the Tour de France, apart from rest days. I get a rest. Yay! So with that being said, just make sure that you've hit that notification button so you know when you go live. And then you get the latest news. You get the latest news from, uh, from not from the horse's mouth, but I'm going to be watching it. So as much as you can from the horse's mouth, okay? Bye.